Precious Lord, touch my lips of clay, that my words may not just be my words. We all may be blessed by your Holy Spirit and your Holy Scripture, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've got some meaty scripture today, which I'm going to concentrate on. You'll be delighted to hear. Um, I'm getting into the habit of this preaching from the gospel uh, because I have the words of Deacon Jim whispering behind me. And, uh, <coughs> Who is going to preach from the gospel today? No. no, as I said that last week. Um, <coughs> there are several themes here which I'm going to look at. Uh, one of them is uh, discipleship and <coughs> obedience. Two terrifying words in the modern church, even more terrifying in MCC, I mean, my goodness, you know. <laughs> and yet, we accept in almost every other area of our life, if we want anything which is of value, uh, we put in work. That our free will, our decision to pursue that, doesn't stop with that initial decision. It is played out every time you practice the piano, every time you practice a foreign language, every time you go hiking or you go to the gym, you are reaffirming your act of will to follow that particular goal. Every time. And we find no difficulty in that, generally. You know, we don't find it surprising that if we're going to take up something with which we are unfamiliar, say language, for example. As children, we can all make noise. Everyone can make a noise. Every baby can make a noise. Making those initial noises as a baby is one of the most truthful things we will ever do in our life. A baby doesn't lie. A baby screams when it's in pain. It cries out when it's hungry. It laughs and chuckles when it's happy. And it belches when it has gas. <laughs> but language, to teach it language, in order to allow it to fully outwork the person of that child, is a process, and a process which requires constant interaction, and it requires practice and determination, it requires teaching, it requires many, many hours of trying to learn to read, and it also requires to be able to get over the fact that you're bored with it very quickly and you want nothing more to do with it. And remember that in order to live out your full humanity, you're going to have to learn how to speak. We accept this. Making noise is given to us freely by God. But in order to be able to fully express that gift, it requires determination, discipleship, self-discipline, all those unpopular things. Equally unpopular with me as with anyone else. Because like Oscar Wilde, I can resist anything except temptation. <laughs> However, we are at the point whereby uh, faith is one of those areas which uh, is supposed to be immediately accessible. And it's no different to any other thing which contains itself extraordinary value and riches in that it is not actually immediately accessible. There is a process of discernment and discipleship that goes on in each and every one of our lives in order to draw closer to an understanding of God and to get a richer faith life. Everything we learn, every experience we have, builds that relationship with the divine within us even though the fundamental seed of it is just given. It's just given for free. Just like the shouting and screaming of a baby is a truthful and yet fundamental gift from God. The building of language is more of a process, but it reaches the lofty heights of the grandeur of our language or any other language that one speaks the great works of literature, the great inspirational works, and fundamentally, without that finessing of language, we wouldn't have the Bible either. We wouldn't have the scriptures which have been left to us. So this is a fundamental principle. And in some ways, I think uh, many denominations, including our own, have kind of piggybacked <laughs> on the work that's been done in the past. Uh, in the 1980s and 90s, many of the people who came through the doors of MCC were Christianized by nature, whether by uh, Baptists, whether by Methodists, whether by Roman Catholics, whether by Pentecostal churches, they were 
Christianized because society uh, uh, and the expectations of their parents have still taught them the basics, which allowed them to return to it uh, as that craving grew within them. But we are now coming across generations of people who are not remotely Christianized, and that means uh, that our churches are going to have to look at ways of building, well, what, what, what some of our brethren call a catechumen, meaning teaching the faith again. And it must be a broad faith, because just like those people who came to MCC uh, 20, 30 years ago and brought with them their faith traditions, we have to be able to teach a concept of the Christian faith which includes those nuances and all that richness from the Southern Gospel tradition to the, uh, the New England Congregational tradition to the African American Church tradition to the Roman Catholic tradition and even the Orthodox tradition. And how are we going to do that without contradicting ourselves? Well, it's going to take an awful lot of thought. This building of what I'll call a broad catechism uh, and a way in which people may uh, intensify their relationship with God by understanding the context in which they are finding that God. Partly comes through the word preached every week. That's part of it. That's uh, a wonderful opportunity for teaching. But there's also scope where the basics can be taught. And in September, we're going to be starting with uh, Christianity 101. Now, if you don't consider yourself to be a rank beginner, you can still come along, because you will have an awful lot to offer. Uh, because I am the product of really only one or two uh, faith traditions. And the more people who come along, who can give their perspectives, the richer our understanding of what we call the Christian faith is going to be. Amen. Now, this includes preparation uh, before accessing uh, some of the um, richnesses of the tradition. We don't require that you go through a process of, of, of catechumenate, that's the word, of teaching and, and training and prayer and uh, consideration before baptism, for example. But you might want to ask it of yourself. You might decide that that's something you want to choose. We have an open communion. You may all come forward and receive communion because of the decision in your heart. You may personally decide uh, that you want to spend a time of discovery and uh, discernment before that's something that you approach if you've never done it before. That's open to you. And I think our role as a church is presenting this catechumen, presenting this broad church training as yet another possibility for the people of faith. Yet another tool for your faith journey. Something which is offered, freely offered, but not enforced. There's a big difference there. So one thing that we start to learn when we uh, intensify our relationship with the faith is the pointlessness of trying to just reason it away. Uh, whenever we're dealing with somebody who is implacably opposed to everything we're doing. We're never going to satisfactorily uh, explain our situation to them. We have to require a certain goodwill to be able to have any sort of meaningful relationship sometimes, you know? If somebody's out to get you, anything you say is going to be the wrong thing. And what we see here is Jesus talking about John the Baptist and, and then Jesus and saying, look, we are never going to be right with these people unless there is going to be a leap of faith or when they choose to believe, or at least give us the benefit of the doubt, we are always going to be in the wrong. So, Christianity is not just about apologetics. It's not just about explaining to people why it's not completely ludicrous and unreasonable to believe these things, because that's always in the realms of reason. It's got a place, but ultimately you're going to be asked for a leap of faith. You're going to be asked for something which is irrational as well as rational. So Jesus says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he's got a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunken, and friends of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Yet cannot win when someone's out to get you like that. And therefore you cannot rest your self-identity 
upon the opinions of others who do not have the full story. Uh, we find ourselves uh, uh, using a simile I've used many times before, living in a courthouse with a prosecuting attorney and us as a defending attorney. And once you start down that road, well, misery awaits you, you know? <sighs> dear, oh dear. I've been there myself. You have to start with this expectation. You have to start with a hunger for the divine, even if you don't understand what it is you're hungering. You have to be wanting something which is more than what you get in the everyday life in order to be willing to make that leap of faith and start on that journey of discipleship in the first place. And in many ways, these things are irrational. They're between you and your God, and you're going to have a devil of a job, job ever explaining them in perfect detail to anybody, no matter how close they are to you. That's an irrational leap of faith. It is a vision glorious. It drives us forward and brings us into a deeper relationship with God ultimately. And therefore, I think in some ways, I've made a mistake in the past of believing that my reason, my reason can explain why I've given my life to, to this and why I've given my life to worshipping God. And I have not always been brave enough to admit that it is faith that's made me do that mm -hmm. and a fundamentally supernatural experience that I had that led me forward. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to understand that the reason's in there, but so is faith and so is tradition. And by tradition, I mean the historical uh, faith setting that we find ourselves in. Now for us, a lot of that is MCC and its history. But it's also uh, our first inklings of what Christianity might have meant as children. It's also the experience that we've had elsewhere. It may be experiences which we wouldn't automatically call Christian, but are, are experiences of sublime. It might be going up the mountainside on a glorious evening and seeing the sun setting over the hills, which first makes you open to the concept of the sublime because if God is anything, God is sublime. And if religious experience is anything, it is ecstatic. And ecstatic fundamentally means stepping out of ourselves. So Jesus sets it out like this. Jesus is asking for discipleship. He is asking for people to follow him. And yet he presents us with a quandary. We expect that if we're going to be disciples and in some ways obedient to the fundamental principles of this person who is Jesus, this is going to be a burden to us. And yet the paradox is that if we take upon ourselves this yoke which has been offered by Jesus Christ, which is one of humility and self-knowledge, it is one of openness and compassion, then this yoke is light. The burden is easy. And what we think we were doing in protecting ourselves from this yoke was actually making our life infinitely more difficult. And then we take on our, our, set upon ourselves the teachings and the persons of this Jesus guy, this Jesus of Nazareth, then we find that there is extraordinary rest involved in this. There is liberation. I've spoken many times before about how burdensome self-defense is. What a burden it is. Telling everybody and everything and yourself that you've never done nothing wrong, that you're always in the right, and that nobody and no thing has any excuse uh, to ever look to you for something different. This is a burden. And in faith, we find an ease for that burden. We find something more, something which is worth living for and dying for, something which is worth making to complete idiot of ourselves in the face of some of the people that we care about. I'm not saying you have to start going door to door, giving out tracts, <laughs> which can be somewhat counterproductive. <laughs> However, it would be a laugh if I was to go along with it. But still, no, no, we're not going to do that. But sometimes what it does mean is giving your testimony in careful ways. In insightful ways, not in the way that I got something wonderful and by giving it to you, you somehow become an extension of me. That's not what I'm talking about.
But what it is, is there are many things that would have happened to each and every one of you, which you see maybe as something horrible which you just carry with you, but you don't realize it could be salvation to someone else. And that giving up of the secret keeping and the self-defense can be transformative to those around us. How many times do we realize that we're not alone when someone close to us finally breaks down and admits what's been going on in their life? And we've been going through something similar and we would never have known. We walk down the street and we think everyone's got it together because that's what they look like nine times out of ten unless it's completely broken down. And so we live in loneliness and isolation when all it takes is testimony to realize that we are going through the same damn thing. And that there is balm for ourselves. There is consolation in companionship. There are people who have compassion for us because they've experienced the same thing. And in our faith life, it comes down to that. Many of us feel isolated, surrounded by a society that looks at us as dangerous lunatics at best. <laughs> Blimey, you think it's bad age. You see it in England. <laughs> and yet, and yet, and yet, and yet, if we take on the burden, if we can get over our fears, if we can look deep into ourselves and discover who we are and what it is that we're giving to God, uh, then we become a means of transformation, not just for ourselves, but for others. <coughs> so what did Jesus say? Come to me, all ye who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first scripture I ever learned was that. And it had stuck with my father all his life. He's now 82 years old. He still remembers singing a little motet which had that text as a choir boy in Hastings in the 1940s during the war. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. He couldn't remember any of it more than that. And yet, I would still catch him at off times singing it to himself. And when times were burdensome and difficult, he'd sing it to himself. Mm -hmm. And I learned it like the back of my hand. So remember, people's faith may look weird from the outside. It may be down to one line from something they learned as a teenager, which sustains them. Uh, but it can have a transformative effect on others. I commend to you today's scripture. In Jesus' name. Amen.